if you read the scriptures, you know that Pilate made a grave decision when he decided to crucify Jesus. But not many have had the opportunity to hear from Pilate's side how he felt, what uh, enforced his decision outside of the scriptural references in the gospel. So today we are going to look at a book that is called Arco Volume or the Archaeological Writings of the Sanhedrin and Talmuds of the Jews. These are the official documents made in these courts in the days of Jesus Christ. Uh, the book was written by Reverend W.D. Uh, Mahan, translated by these doctors, Dr. Mc, McIntosh and uh, Twyman of the Antiquarian Lodge in Italy. So this this book is some really heavy stuff. We're going to go ahead and read some of uh, Pilate's report back to uh, Tiberius Augustus. And you are going to get an idea of why uh, Pilate made the decision to crucify Jesus and his thoughts regarding the Jews, the nation of the Jews. So let's go ahead and and get into this. And we're, we're going to start with chapter eight. And this Va, uh, Valius notes. Acta Palata or Pilate's report to Caesar of the arrest, trial and crucifixion of Jesus. Valius uh, Patal. Patarculus, a Roman historian, was 19 years old when Jesus was born. His works have been thought to be extinct. I know of but two historians that make reference to his writings, uh, Priscian, and excuse me if I jack up the pronunciation of these names, and Tacitus who speak of him as a descendant of an equestrian family of Campania. From what we gather from these writers, Valius must have been a close friend of Caesar who raised him by degrees until he came one till he became one of the great men of Rome. And from the six and, and for 16 years commanded the army. He returned to Rome in the year 31 and finish his work, which was called Historia Romania. He held the office of Praetor, uh, I guess, when Augustus died, and while Vincius was con consul. Valia says that in Judea he met a man called Jesus of Nazareth, who was one of the most remarkable characters he had ever seen that he was more afraid of Jesus than of a whole army, for he had cured all manner of diseases and raised the dead. And when he, and when he cured the orchards, or when he cursed, excuse me, the orchards or fruit trees, let's go to the next chapter, for their barrenness, they instantly withered to their roots. After referring to the wonderful works of Jesus, he says that although Jesus had such power, he did not use it to injure anyone, but seemed always inclined to help the poor. Valius says the Jews were divided in their opinion of him, the poor class claiming him as their king and deliver and their deliverer from Roman authority and that if Jesus should raise an army and give it the power, he could uh, sweep the world in a single day. But the rich Jews hated and cursed him behind his back. And I can see why. 
and called him an Egyptian, an Egyptian necromancer. Though that that's an Egyptian musician, magician. Uh, though they were as afraid of him as of death. Now we go to Pilate's report here. And it says to Tiberius Caesar, emperor of Rome. Noble sovereign greeting. The events of the last few days in my province have been of such a character that I will give the details in full as they occurred. As I should not be surprised if, in the course of time, they may change the destiny of our nation, for it seems of late that all the gods have ceased to be propitious. I am almost ready to say, Cursed be the day that I succeeded Valerius uh, Flacius in the government of Judea. For since then, my life has been one of continual uneasiness and distress. On my arrival at Jerusalem, I took possession of the praetorium and ordered a splendid feast to be prepared, to which I invited the Tetrarch of Galilee with the high priest and his officers. At the appointed hour, no guests appeared. This I considered an insult offered to my dignity and to the whole government which I represent. Now, I don't see that as a lie, because if you go to the book of Acts chapter 10, you hear disciples questioning Peter about the fact that he went out to eat with the unclean. So I can see the Jews doing that. And why? Because in the list of clean and unclean animals, which is parabolic, symbolic in nature, and, and we can get to that some other time, but the point is, in the prophecies, Jesus himself called the Romans or other nations that were not of Israel dogs. You look at the Greek woman, he implied it there. Uh, the Greek woman who had, I think it was a son or a daughter. Uh, and he was talking about the fact that um, that no one should steal the children's bread. And then she came back and said, but even the dogs uh, eat from the eat the crumbs from the children's table. That that, that Jesus is referring to symbolically i like to say parabolically because he uh, makes them like they're like the unclean and a dog would be unclean according to the prescription of the law of moses because it has web feet so let's move on uh a few days after a few days after the high priest dined to pay me a visit, his deportment was grave and deceitful. He pretended that his religion forbade him, forbade him and his attendants to sit at the table of the Romans and eat and offer libations with them. But this was only a sacrum, uh, what is this, sanctimonious seeming for his very countenance betrayed his hypocrisy. Although I thought it expedient to accept his excuse, from that moment I was convinced that the conquered had declared themselves the enemy of the conquerors. And I would warn the Romans to beware of the high priests of this country. They would betray their own mother to gain office and a luxurious living. It seems to me that of conquered cities, Jerusalem is the most difficult to govern. So turbulent are the people that I live in momentary dread of an insurrection. I have not soldiers sufficient to suppress it. I had only one Ceterian and a hundred men at my command. 
I requested a reinforcement uh, from the perfect of Syria, who informed me that he had scarcely troops sufficient to defend his own province. <laughs> Excuse me. In sadient thirst for conquest to extend our empire beyond the means of defending it, I fear will be the cause of the final overthrow of our whole government. I live secluded from the masses, for I did not know what those priests might influence the rabble to do. Yet I endeavored to ascertain as far as I could the mind and standing of the people. Among the various rumors that came to my ears, there was one in particular that attracted my attention. A young man, it was said, had appeared in Galilee preaching with a noble unction, a new law in the name of the God that had sent him. At first, I was apprehensive that his design was to stir up the people against the Romans, but my fears were soon dispelled. Jesus of Nazareth rather uh, spoke rather as a friend of the Roman than of the Jews. And that's only because Jesus did not come to incite a resurrection and he did not come to enforce his authority to bring about the, the, the restore, restoration of the throne of David on earth, the kingdom of heaven. And for the most part, that displeased a lot of the hypocrites in Jerusalem of that day, because even John the Baptist assumed that Jesus had came to restore the kingdom and take them from up under the power of the Romans. One day in Passing by the uh, place of uh, Silo, where there was a great concourse of people, I observed in the midst of the group a young man who was leaning against a tree, calmly addressing the multitude. I was told it was Jesus. This I could easily have suspected, so great was the difference between him and those listening to him. His golden colored hair and beard gave to his, let's start over. His golden colored hair and beard gave to his appearance a celestial aspect. He appeared to be about 30 years of age. Never have I seen a sweeter or more serene countenance. What a contrast between him and his hearers with their black beards and tawny complexions. Now, let me stop right there because when you hear this statement, and this could be one of the reasons why there was so much uh, strife placed upon the, the writing of this book, because it, you'll go to the books in the 18th century and older, and they describe the Jews, the Jews who uh, came from, were moved from Babylon to Spain, uh, the Jews who migrated down to West Africa, Southern Africa, parts of East Africa, around the Niger River. Uh, they describe them as tawny or swarthy in complexion. And those two terms mean brown. And they also described them as Negro, the Spanish and Portuguese word for black. Now, when he says that his golden color hair and beard gave, uh, gave to his appearance a celestial aspect, his golden color hair doesn't mean that he's white. Because black people, especially in that time, have golden colored hair. And you can see that from the image image of uh, this tomb here in Egypt depicting the Shemites in slavery 
and you can also see the picture that I just placed up here for you to see a black child with golden looking hair and even blue eyes. So these are not out of the realm of reason for so-called black people. Unwilling to interrupt him by my presence, I continued my walk, but signified to my secretary to join the group and listen. My secretary's name is Menlius. He is the grandson of the chief of the conspirators, conspir conspirators who encamped in Etoria waiting for Cataline. Menlius had been for a long time an inhabitant of Judea and is well acquainted with the Hebrew language. He was devoted to he was devoted to me and worthy of my confidence. On entering the praetorium, I found Menlius, who related to me the words Jesus had pronounced at Shiloh. Silo. Never have I read in the works of the philosophers anything that can compare to the max maxims of Jesus. One of the rebel, uh, one of the rebellious Jews, so numerous in Jerusalem, having asked Jesus if it was lawful to give tribute to Caesar, he replied, "Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, and unto God the things that are God's." Now, Caesar must have been spying on Jesus for some time because this is a specific statement that Jesus spoke to the crowds. It was on account of the wisdom of his sayings that I granted so much liberty to the Nazarene, for it was in my power to have had him arrested and exiled to Pontus. But that would have been contrary to the justice which has always categorized the Roman government in all its dealings with men. This man was neither seditious nor rebellious. I extended to him my protection, unknown perhaps to himself. Not that Jesus needed it. He was at liberty to act, to speak, to assemble and address the people and to choose disciples unrestrained by any praetorian mandate. So what he's saying here is that he gave Jesus free range, not that Jesus needed it, but in comparison to others in that time who would have incited a rebellion, they were on extreme watch. Should it ever happen, may the gods avert the omen. Should it ever happen, I say that the religion of our forefathers will be supplanted by the religion of Jesus. It will be to this noble uh, toleration that Rome shall owe her premature death, while I, miserable wretch, will have been the instrument of what the Jews call providence and we call destiny. This unlimited freedom granted to Jesus provoked the Jews, not the poor, but the rich and powerful. It is true. Jesus was, sev was severe on the latter, and this was a political reason, in my opinion, for not restraining the liberty of the Nazarene. Scribes and Pharisees, he would say to them, you are a race of vipers. You resemble painted uh, sepulchres. You appear well unto men, but you have death within you. At other times, he would sneer at the arms of the rich and proud, telling them that the might of the poor was more precious in the sight of God. Complaints were daily made at the praetorium against the insolence of Jesus which this is believable because if you read in the book of Josephus, uh, there's 
a statement which said that Rome made all of the decisions and that was set up so that the the high priests and the high officials can have the power to teach the uh the the people in Judea the religion and and have control there so in uh exchange they exchange they exchange that according to Josephus the the Israelites, the Jews would pay the tax to the Romans and, and the Romans would make the decisions and the two would have to hear any uh, a decision of law. But at the end of the day, the Romans had the final say so. And that is that that is true because you see that they couldn't just crucify Jesus they made designs to get him crucified by the Roman. Yes. Because of the time of day, they were in a feast day or approaching the feast day and didn't want to make themselves unclean. Supposedly. But at the end of the day, Rome still was the decision maker and anything that went on in their so-called colonies. I'll say. I was even informed that some misfortune, some misfortune would befall him. That is Jesus, that it would not be the first time that Jerusalem had stoned those who called themselves prophets An appeal would be made to Caesar. However, my conduct was approved by the Senate and I was promised a reinforcement after the termination of of the uh, Parthian War. Being too weak to suppress an, an insurrection, I resolved upon adopting a measure that promised to restore the tranquility of the city without subjecting the Praetorium to humiliating concision. I wrote to Jesus requesting an interview with him at the Praetorium. He came. You know that in my veins flows the Spanish mix with Roman blood and incapable uh, uh, and incapable as incapable of fear as it is of weak emotion. When the Nazarene made his appearance, I was walking in my basilic and my feet seemed fastened with an iron hand to the marble pavement and I trembled in every limb as does a guilty culprit though the Nazarene was as calm as as innocence itself when he came up to me he stopped and by a signal sign he seemed to say to me I'm here though he spoke not a word for some time I contemplated with admiration and awe this extraordinary type of man a type of man unknown to our numerous painters who have given form and figure to all the gods and the heroes there was nothing about him that was repelling in its character yet i felt too awed and uh tremulous to approach him jesus said i unto him at last and that and my tongue uh, faltered, Jesus of Nazareth, for the last three years, I have granted you ample freedom of speech, nor do I regret it. Your words are those of a sage. I know not whether you have read Socrates or Plato, but this I know, there is in your discourse discourses a majestic simplicity that elevates you far above those philosophers. Now, when he was ta- when when a uh, pilot was talking about the fact that there was designs to murder Jesus, and then he says that he spoke to Jesus and said, "For the last three years, I've granted you ample freedom of speech." Jesus only, according to the scriptures, only preached in uh, Judah, Judea 
for three years. So his interview with Jesus has to be sometime before Jesus's trial with Caiaphas and his uh, crucifixion by um, Pilate himself. We're down here. The emperor is informed of it. And I, his humble representative in this country, am glad of allowing you the liberty of which you are so worthy. However, I must not conceal from you that your discourses have raised up against you powerful and inveterate enemies. Nor is this surprising. Socrates had his enemies and he fell a victim to their hatred. Yours are doubly incensed against you on account of your discourses being so severe upon their conduct against me on account of the liberty I have afforded you. They even accuse me of being indirectly leagued with you for the purpose of depriving the Hebrews of the little civil power which Rome has left them. My request, I do not say my order is, that you be more circumspect and moderate in your discourses in the future and more considerate of them lest you arouse the pride of your enemies we're at the top and they rise against you the stupid populace and compel me to employ the instruments of law so in other words uh Pilate is asking Jesus to not offend the rich and the prideful when he calls them vipers and things of such uh, 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 of such and to just kind of calm down his message a little bit. But at the end, Jesus' enemies, his own people, raised up against him, a uh, populace, and eventually Pilate was compelled to employ the instruments of law. The Nazarene calmly replied, replied, Prince of the earth, your words proceed not from true wisdom. Say to the torrent to stop in the midst of the mountain gorge. It will uproot the trees of the valley. The torrent will answer you that it obeys the laws of nature and the creator. God alone knows whether flow the water waters of the torrent verily i say unto you before the rose of sharon blossoms the blood of the just shall be spilt and what he is saying here is a parable and we know that the rose of sharon is jesus and as a flower comes up out the ground jesus who is a seed the seed of the word of god was placed in the ground at his death. That's why he says the blood of the just shall be spilt. He is the just. And it was his blood that was spilt. And as he said in his parable, unless a grain of wheat be put in the ground, you can figure out the rest. He rose again because he is the rose of Sharon that blossoms so he was preaching the gospel to Pilate in a parable and Pilate didn't understand he didn't understand because he says your blood shall not be spilt said I with deep emotion you are more precious in my estimation on account of your wisdom than all the the turbulent and proud Pharisees who abused the freedom granted them by the Romans. They conspire against Caesar. They convert his bounty into fear, uh, impressing the unlearned that Caesar is a tyrant and seeks their ruin. Insolent wretch, wretches, they are not aware that the wolf of the Tiber sometimes clothed himself 
with the skin of the sheep to accomplish his wicked designs. I will protect you against them. My praetorium shall be an uh, asylum, sacred both day and night. Jesus carelessly shook his head and said with a grave and divine smile, when the day shall have come, there will be no asylums for the son of man, neither in the earth nor under the earth. The asylum of the just is there pointing to the heavens. What he said was when the day shall have come, there will be no asylums for the son of man, neither in the earth nor under the earth. The asylum of the just is there up in heaven. That which is written in the books of the prophets must be accomplished. So Jesus is telling Pilate that he knows he's going to die and that he has to die. He knows that because the the, the prophets and the Psalms and the law of Moses must be fulfilled. So there is no way that Pilate is making these statements up as he's uh, talking with Jesus. Young man, I answered mildly, you will oblige me to convert my request into an order. The safety of the province, which has been co uh, confined to my care, requires it. You must observe more moderation in your discourses. Now Pilate is getting a little bit orderly. Do not infringe my order. You know the consequences. May happiness attend you. Farewell. And Jesus replies, Prince of the earth, replied Jesus, I come not to bring war into the world, but peace love and charity i was born the same day on which augustus caesar gave peace to the roman world uh persecutions proceed not from me i expect it from others and will meet it meet it in obedience to the will of my father who has shown me the way restrain therefore your worldly prudence it is not in your power to arrest the victim at the foot of the tabernacle of expiation. <laughs> I tell you, these are some sayings. Just go to the book of uh, the uh, Leviticus and you'll get an understanding of what he is saying because the victim is the, the sheep or the goat that was arrested at the 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 uh the foot of the tabernacle at the at the um the tent of the tabernacle right at the door and they laid their hands on it to slit its throat to kill it so that they can sprinkle his blood on the altar and then ultimately sacrifice it this is what jesus is talking about here so saying he disappeared like a bright shadow behind the curtains of the basilic. To my great relief, for I felt a heavy burden on me of which I could not relieve myself while in his presence. To Herod, who then reigned in Galilee, the enemies of Jesus addressed themselves to wreak their vengeance on the Nazarene. Had Herod consulted in my own in his inclinations, he would have ordered Jesus immediately to be put to death. But though proud of his royal dignity, yet he hesitated to commit an act that might lessen the, his influence with the Senate or like me was afraid of Jesus. But it would never do for a Roman officer to be scared by a Jew. Previously to this, Herod called on me at the praetorium and on rising to take leave after some trifling conversation asked me what was my opinion concerning the nazarene i replied that 
Jesus appeared to me to be one of those great philosophers that great nations sometimes produce, that his doctrines were by no means sacrilegious and that the intentions of Rome were to leave him to that freedom of speech, which was justified by his actions. Herod smiled maliciously and saluting me with uh, ir ironical request, departed. So Pilate was just fine with Jesus going about um, preaching his doctrines um, in Judea because they, one, wasn't against Rome, and two, they offended the rich and the proud that he thought was untrustworthy anyway. So he was happy to do that. The great feast of the Jews was approaching and the intention was to avail themselves of the popular exhortation, which always, excuse me, which always manifests itself at the psalm, uh, psalm of a Passover. The city was over overflowing with a tumultuous populace clamoring for the death of the Nazarene. My miseries informed me that the treasure of the temple had been employed in bribing the people. Wow. So they used the temple money to bribe the people to create this big, this tumultuous populace calling for the death of Jesus. So for money, they betrayed Jesus, the crowds. The danger was pressing. A Roman centurion had been insulted. I wrote to the perfect of Syria for a hundred foot soldiers and as many cavalry. He declined. I saw myself alone with a handful of veterans in the midst of a rebellious city, too weak to suppress an uprising and having no choice left but to tolerate it. They had seized upon Jesus and the seditious rabble, although they had nothing to fear from the praetorium, believing as their leaders had told them that I winked at their sedition, continued uh, vociferating, crucify him, crucify him. Three powerful parties had combined together at the at that time against Jesus. First, the Herodians and the Sadducees, whose seditious conduct seemed to have proceeded from double motives. They hated the Nazarene and were impatient of the Roman yoke. They never forgave me of having entered the holy city with banners that bore the image of the Roman emperor. And although in this instance I had committed a fatal error, yet the sacrilege did not appear less heinous in their eyes. Another grievance, grievance also rankled in their bosoms. I had proposed to employ a part of the treasure of the temple in erecting edifices for public use. My proposal was scorned. The Pharisees were, were the avowed enemies of Jesus. They cared not for the government. They bore with bitterness, the severe reprimands which the Nazarene for three years had been continually giving them wherever he went. Timid and too weak to act by themselves, they had embraced the quarrels of the Herodians and the Sadducees. You know, in Jesus's preaching and his teaching, you know, in, in well, maybe this is in, uh, more liberal churches. Jesus is taught to be this kind, loving, wouldn't offend anybody individual. And he is kind and he is loving, but he also defended the Pharisees, Sadducees, and, and Herodians to the core. They hated Jesus. And Pilate um, is telling us that. But we know that from scripture, but the measure of that hate, we don't necessarily get because most of the focus of the gospels is on 
Jesus himself and what he did for the poor and the weak and, you know, through his miracles and things of that nature. And, and the rich, they just really hated the fact that Jesus is right anyway. Besides these three parties, I had to contend against the reckless and profligate populace always ready to join a sedition. So not only the Herodians and the Sadducees and um, who else did he say? Uh, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, but he also had to contend to contend with those who would just join the sedition anyway. Um, because, you know, a lot of them just didn't agree with how the Romans treated them. But the point is, is that anyone who calls themselves a Jew in that land was within this big tumultuous populace that was screaming for the crucifixion of Jesus. And to profit by the disorder and confusion that resulted therefrom. I think I, I found my way back. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So Jesus was dragged before the high priest and condemned to death. It was then that the high priest Caiaphas performed a divisory act of, sub, of submission he sent his prisoner to me to confirm his condemnation and secure his execution. And we know this to be true because we see that after they spit on Jesus, beat him, punch him, this, that, and the third, they sent him right to Pilate so Pilate can execute him. And, and that's only because at the end of the day, they are in the power of the Romans. And like it or not, God placed the Romans in power, just like he did the Babylonians, just like he did the Greeks, just like he did any foreign nation who, um, who, who, um, what's the word I'm trying to say? Who, who put, placed them in oppression, excuse me. I answered him that as Jesus was a Galilean, the affair came under Herod's jurisdiction and ordered him to be sent thither, thither. And we see that in the Gospels. The Willie Tetrarch professed hum humility and protesting his defense or uh, difference to the lieutenant of Caesar. He committed the fate of the man to my hands. Soon my palace assumed the aspect of the besieged chattered, a ch citadel. So Pilate is trying to get Jesus and what's going to happen to Jesus off his hands and place it back into the hands of the Jews under the authority of Herod. But Herod, he doesn't want any parts of this and sends him back. Every moment increased the number of the malcontents. Jerusalem was inundated with crowds from the mountains of Nazareth. All Judea appeared to be pouring into the city. So this just this wasn't any regular event. And this is something that Pilate is going to have to answer to because any uprising of any magnitude has to be discussed with the emperor. Why is his province um, operating in, in disorder? I had taken a wife from among the Gauls. Now, everybody should know who the Gauls is. Eventually, they the Gauls came and took over uh, Spain and Portugal sometime before 711 AD in which the Moors conquered Spain, Granada and, and all of that area and among the Moors and you should notice among the Moors were Muslim and Jews and they are called Moors 
for one reason. Let y'all figure that one out. I had taken a wife from among the Gauls who pretended to see in futurity. Weeping and throwing herself at my feet, she said to me, Beware, beware, and touch not that man, for he is holy. Last night I saw him in a vision. He was walking on the waters. He was flying on the wings of the wind. He spoke to the tempest and to the fishes of the lake. All were obedient to him. Behold, the torrent in Mount Kidron flows with blood. The statues of Caesar are filled with uh, Jemonide. The columns of the interim have given way away and the sun is veiled in mourning like a vestal in a tomb. Ah, pallet, evil awaits thee. If thou wilt not listen to the vows of thy wife, dread the curse of a Roman senate. Dread the frowns of Caesar. And eventually, Pilate was killed. By this time, the marble stairs groaned under the weight of the multitude. The Nazarene was brought back to me. I proceeded to the halls of justice, followed by my guard, and asked the people in a severe tone what they demanded. The death of the Nazarene was the reply. For what crime he was black he has blasphemed he has prophesied the ruin of the temple he calls himself the son of god the messiah the king of the jews roman justice said i punishes not such offenses with death crucify him crucify him cried the relentless rabble the uh, vociferations of the inf infuriated mob shook the palace to its foundation. There was but one who appeared to be calm in the midst of the vast multitude. It was the Nazarene. After many fruitless attempts to protect him from the fury of his merciless persecutors, I adopted a measure which at the moment appeared to me to be the only one that could save his life. I propose, as it was, the custom to deliver a prisoner on such occasions, to release Jesus and let him go free, that he might be the scapegoat, as they called it, because he understands their law because they have to go back and forth with each other's law, but at the end of the day, the decision is Pilate's or, or Rome. Or I should say the decision is Augustus Caesar's, but Pilate is executing that decision on behalf of the emperor. So it all leads back to Rome at the end of the day. But they said Jesus must be crucified. I then spoke to them of the inconsistency of their course as being incompatible with their laws showing that no criminal judge could pass sentence on a criminal unless he had fasted one whole day and that the sentence must have the consent of the Sanhedrin and the signature of the president of that court that no criminal could be executed on the same day his sentence was fixed and the next day on the day of his execution the Sanhedrin was required to review the whole proceedings. Also, according to their law, a man was stationed at the door of the court with a flag and another a short way off on horseback to cry the name of the criminal and his crime and the names of his witnesses and to know if anyone could testify in his favor because they have to have two or three witnesses and the prisoner on his way to execution had the right to turn back three times and to plead any new thing in his favor. I urge all these pleas, hoping that they might, or, that they might awe them into subjection, but they still cried, crucify him, crucify him. I then ordered Jesus to be scourged, hoping this might satisfy them. But it only increased their fury. 
I then called for a basin and washed my hands in the presence of the clamorous multitude, thus testifying that in my judgment, Jesus of Nazareth had done nothing deserving of death, but in vain it was his life these wretched, wretched, wretches thirst for. Often in our civil commotions, I have witnessed the furious anger of the multitude, but nothing could be compared to what I witnessed on this occasion. So Pilate is saying that he has heard civil commotions before, but this takes the cake. The thirst for death of the Nazarene of Jesus, my Lord and Savior, was to such a point that Pilate says, and and keep in mind the fact that there are commotions like this around the Roman provinces. I mean, take for example North North Africa. So they he has experienced civil commotions, but this has taken the cake. Their thirst for Jesus's blood, their anger at the fact of what Jesus taught and said to the crowds and his offenses of them to them made this a, 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 a heavy and, and, you know, to a high degree, a massive event. It might have been truly said that all the phantoms of the infernal regions had assembled at Jerusalem. The crowd appeared not to walk, but to be borne off and whirled as a vortex, rolling along in living waves from the portals of the Praetorium even unto Mount Zion with howling screams, shrieks, and vociferations such as were never heard in the seditions of the Pannonia or in the tumults of the forum. By degrees, the day darkened like a winter's twilight, such as had been at the death of the great Julius Caesar. It was like the eyes of March. I, the continued governor of a rebellious province, was leaning against a column of my basilic, contemplating athwart the daring gloom these fiends of Tartarus dragging the execution dragging to execution the innocent Nazarene all around me was deserted Jerusalem had vomited forth her indwellers through the funeral gate that leads to Gemonica an air of desolation and page 42 sadness enveloped me. My gods had joined the Calvary and the Saturian with the display of power was endeavoring to keep order. I was left alone and my breaking heart admonished me that what was passing at that moment appertain rather to the history of the gods than that of men. A loud clamor was heard proceeding from Golgotha, which borne on the wind seemed to announce an, an agony such as was never heard by mortal ears. Dark clouds lowered over the pinnacle of the temple and setting over the city covered it as with a veil. So dreadful were the signs that men saw both in the heavens and on the earth that Dionysus, the Arapagate, excuse me if I'm jacking that up, is reported to have exclaimed, either the author of nature is suffering or the universe is falling apart. While these, while these appalling scenes of nature were transpiring, there was a dreadful earthquake in Lower Egypt, which filled everybody with fear and scared 
and scared the superstitious Jews almost to death. It is said, Batharsar, an aged and learned Jew of Antioch, was found dead after the excitement was over. Whether he died from alarm or grief is not known. He was a strong friend of the Nazarene. Near the first hour of the night, I threw my mantle around me and went down into the city toward the gates of Gilgotha. The sacrifice was consummated. The crowd was returning home, still agitated. It is true, but gloomy, uh, to sit turn and desperate. What they had witnessed has stricken them with terror and remorse. I also saw my little Roman cohort pass by mournfully, the standard bearer having veiled his eagle in token of grief. And I overheard some of the Jewish soldiers murmuring strange words, which I did not understand, probably because they were saying it in Hebrew. Others were recounting miracles very like those which have so often smitten the Romans by the will of the gods. Sometimes groups of men and women would halt, then looking back toward Mount Calvary, would remain motionless in expectation of witnessing some new prodigy. I returned to the Praetorium sad and, pen and pensive, and you have to understand that he probably returned this way because his wife had warned him and he really did not want to do this. But the people of the Jews had placed it in his responsibility by trickery, by trickery. On ascending the stairs, the steps of which were still stained with the blood of the Nazarene, I perceived an old man in a supplanted, 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 supplant posture, excuse me, and behind him several Romans in tears. <clears throat> now, also keep in mind that there were Romans who converted to the religion of the Jews. So this is not surprising. He and and there were Romans who also experienced miracles. Go back to the Gospels and read. He threw himself at my feet and wept most bitterly. It is painful to see an old man weep, and my heart being already overcharged with grief, we, though strangers, wept together. And in truth, it seemed that the tears lay very shallow that day with many whom I perceived in the vast concourse of people. I never witnessed such an extreme revulsion of feeling. Those who betrayed and sold him, those who testified against him, those who cried, crucify him. We have his blood all sunk. We have his blood all sunk off like cowardly curs and wash their teeth with vinegar. As I am told that Jesus taught a resurrection and a separation after death, if such should be the fact, I am sure it commenced in this vast crowd. Father, talking about the old man, said I to him, after gaining control of my feelings, who are you and what is your request? I am Joseph of Amathea, replied he, verse uh, page 44. And I am come to beg of you upon my knees the permission to bury Jesus of Nazareth. Your prayers granted, said I to him. And at the same time, I ordered Menlius to take some soldiers with him to superintend the uh, interment, lest it should be profaned. A few days after the sep sepulchre was found empty, his disciples proclaimed all over the country that Jesus has risen from the dead. As he had foretold, this created more excitement even than the crucifixion. 
As to its truth, I cannot say for certain, but I have made some investigation of the matter. So you can examine for yourself and see if I am in fault, as Herod represents. Joseph buried Jesus in his tomb, in his own tomb, a tomb that was paid for by Joseph. Whether he contemplated his resurrection or calculated to cut him another, I cannot tell. The day after he was buried, one of the priests came to the Praetorium and said they were apprehensive that his disciples intended to steal the body of Jesus and hide it and then make it appear that he had risen from the dead. Now, uh, I want to interject here. How stupid does a, that sound being a possibility? You can just remember after four days what it smelled like, you know, uh, and, and even Mary suggested this. The, the brother of Zach, um, Lazarus suggested that after four days since Lazarus was in in the tomb he if we open that tomb he probably stinks he probably the smell would probably be horrible and to think that they would suggest the disciples would steal the body of Jesus and hide it somewhere where are they going to hide it they don't even have the money for their own tomb a rich man had to come and bury him but I digress uh, to make then make it appear that he had risen from the dead as he had foretold and of which um, they were perfectly convinced. I sent him to the captain of the royal guard, Malchus, to tell him to take the Jewish soldiers, place as many around the sepulcher as were needed then if anything should happen they could blame themselves and not the romans when the great excitement arose about the sepulchre being found empty i felt a deep deeper solicitude than ever i sent for malchus who told me he had placed his lieutenants ben isham uh, with 100 soldiers around the sepulcher, around the grave, he told me that Isham and the soldiers were very much alarmed at what had occurred there that morning. I sent for this man, Isham, who related to me as near as I can recollect the following circumstances. He said that about the beginning of the fourth watch, they saw a soft and beautiful light over the, the grave. He at first thought that the woman had come to embalm the body of Jesus, as was their custom. But he could not uh, but he could not see how they had gotten through the guards. While these thoughts were passing through his mind, behold, the whole place was lighted up. And there seemed to be crowds of the dead in their grave, cl grave clothes. All seemed to be shouting and filled with ecstasy while all around and above was the most beautiful music he had ever heard. And the whole air seemed to be full of voices praising God. At this time, there seemed to be a reeling and swimming of the earth so that he turned so sick and faint that he could not stand on his feet. He said the earth seemed to swim from under him and his senses left him so that he knew not what did occur. I asked him in what condition was uh, he was in when he came uh, to himself. He said he was lying on the ground with his face down. I asked him if he could not have been mistaken as to the light. Was it not day that was coming in the east? He said at first he thought he said at first he thought of that, but at a stone's cast, it was exceedingly dark. And then he remembered it was too early for day. I asked him if his dizziness might have come from being wakened up and getting up so suddenly 
as it sometimes had that effect. He said he was not and not had been asleep all night as the penalty was death for him to sleep on duty. He said he had let some of the soldiers sleep at that t- at at a time. Some were asleep then. I asked him how long the scene lasted. He said he did not know, but he thought nearly an hour. He said it was hid by the light of day. I asked him if he wanted to I asked him if he went to the grave after he had come to himself. He said no because he was afraid that just as soon as relief came, they all went to their quarters. I asked him if he had been questioned by the priest. He said, he said he had, he wanted him to say it was an earthquake and that they were asleep and offered him money to say that the disciples came and stole Jesus but he saw no disciples he did not know what he did not know that the body was gone until he was told i asked him that was the private opinion of those priests let me start that over i asked him what was the private opinion of those priests he had conversed with he said that some of them thought that jesus was no man that he was not a human being that he was not the son of Mary, that he was not the same that was said to be born of the virgin in Bethlehem, that the same person had been on the earth before before with Abraham and Lot and at many times and places. Now, this all comes from uh, the, you know, this comes as a result of people saying that the Christ didn't come in the flesh. If you read the first book of John, uh, you'll get the, uh, the sense of that idea. It seems to me that if the Jewish theory be true, these conclusions are correct, for they are in accord with this man's life, as is known and testified by both friends and foes, for the elements were no more in his hands than the clay in the hands of the porter. He could convert water into wine. He could change death into life, disease into health. He could calm the seas, still the storms, call up fish with with, with a silver coin in its mouth. Now I say, if he could do all these things, which he did, and and mind you, I want to say this, mind you, a lot of people are testifying of these things that they saw, which is why they are written in the Gospels, and many, uh, which he did, and many more, as the Jews all testify. And it was doing these things that created this enmity against him. He was not charged with criminal offenses, nor was he charged with violence in uh, with violating any law nor of wrongdoing, or or I should say, nor of wronging any individual in person. And all these facts are known to thousands as well by his foes as by his friends. I am almost ready to say, as did Manilus at the cross, truly this was the Son of God. Now, noble sovereign, this is as near the facts in the case as I can arrive at, and I have taken pains to make the statement very full so that you may judge my conduct upon the whole as I hear that Antiope, that's Herod, has said many hard things of me in this matter. With the promise of faithfulness and good wishes to my noble sovereign, I am your most obedient servant, Pontius Pilate.